I just want to bid everyone a, a just, just in time for a good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be back with you here in Valley Clare. It's been a wee while from I was here, but it's a pleasure to be back amongst you another time. Just want to thank you for coming out. As Ian has said, it has been a difficult year, and it's sometimes very hard to know to go out, to stay in, to what to do. But I'm pleased to see you here this morning and trust that as we gather around the Word of God, that indeed that we'll be blessed uh, today for being here. I just want to thank Ian for leading, and I want to thank Stephen for his invitation to come. Now, by way of uh, reading the Word of God this morning, I just want to read two verses, and you'll find those in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah and chapter 32. Jeremiah and chapter 32. Ian made mention, as he was making the announcements there, about 2020 being a very difficult year. And someone showed me the other day a post on Facebook, and I don't know whether you're any film buffs here in, in Ballyclare, but I'm sure you've heard tell of the Back to the Future films. And it just showed the two main characters. I couldn't tell you their names. Not for me, as far as I was concerned. The only films they ever made was Toy Story, best movies ever. But from that point of view, it showed the two main characters and it says, whatever you do, don't go to 2020. And isn't it so true as we look back over a year that even considering we probably have spent a massive percentage of it at home in the house, the year has still seemed to fly by so quickly. Jeremiah 32, and we'll read together from verse number 26. Jeremiah 32 and verse 26, it says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And we trust indeed that God will bless the public reading of his word. I wonder, as we've gathered here this morning, again to meet around the word of God and to worship the Lord, even as we'll remember him in his own appointed way a little later, I just wonder what type of God have you and I come to meet with this morning? I wonder how do we actually conceive him today? Have we come this morning to worship some small imagination of God, a small limited character, or have you actually ever stopped to consider the greatness of our God? The greatness of our God. It was Theophilus of Antioch that said of God back in the second century, he said, in glory he is incomprehensible, in greatness he is unfathomable, in height he is inconceivable, in power he is incomparable, in wisdom he is unrivaled, and in kindness he is unutterable. You know, when we look through the scriptures, we can see that we have a God of so many things. If we were to turn to Acts chapter 7 this morning, we could consider that we have a God of glory. We went back to the book of beginnings and into Genesis. We could read there in Genesis 12 about the God of promise, as we see how Abraham has promised that he will be a great nation. Chapter 17 of Genesis, we can see that he's a God of power. You see, and you know the story so well, how indeed that Sarah would bear Isaac even in her old age. Genesis 18, we see a God of fellowship. So you know what I thought as I was coming this morning and as I tried to put an introduction for the message together, I focused in on a God of promise. You know, well, might we consider he's a God of promise. Someone has said that 
The Bible that you hold in your hand, that it contains over 30,000 promises. You know, we can see some of these promises, verses that roll off the tip of our tongue. I just want to remind you of three of them this morning. We consider that we have the promise of His presence. What does He say? He says that where the two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Not only have we the promise of His presence, but we have indeed the promise of His power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. The promise of His presence, the promise of His power, but then we have the promise of His purpose. What does it say? It says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know, dear friends, this morning, I believe that, that what He promises, He is well able to perform. You know, as we come a little later this evening, and as we'll gather together in the car park, and as we'll preach the gospel another time to the unsaved, you know, on an evening like that, as I was eating my breakfast this morning, my wife was listening to a fellow that lives in Cookstown, not that far from us, and he was out walking the dog, and he, he, he's some one of these type of blogger people, he must have been on Instagram, but he said, he says, if you're not out of bed, don't bother, because it's raining, is what he said. Oh dear Christian friends this morning, should we take that attitude this evening? Oh, it's a damp evening. By the time it gets to six o'clock, it'll be dark, it'll be dismal. Dear friends, this evening I'll be here. Why will I be here? Because my God promises that my word shall not return unto me void. We'll be here this evening for the preaching of the gospel. Can I say to you this morning, try to encourage your family members and your friends in that are not yet saved. What an end it would be to 2020 if we were able to see some of these gathered in and reached and saved for the great eternity. You know, there's some phrases that I stumbled across the other day concerning again the greatness of our God. What did I find? Well, I found this. There's no promise too hard for our God to fulfill. Not only that, there's no prayer too hard for our God to answer. There's no person too hard for our God to save. And you know there's no place too hard for our God to revive. Is that not why Shining Lights is going out into the town with the gospel literature? Can I say to you, whoever's going door to door, keep that in the back of your mind. You might think that the town is dark. They've no time for us. They've no time for the message of the gospel. But take encouragement that there's no place too hard for our God to revive. You know, as I thought about the greatness of our God, I thought, I wonder if we were to look and check out what it is that some of the Bible characters say about God. How would they testify of him? Well, I thought of Job, Job 42 and 2. He says, I know that thou canst do everything. We've already thought of Jeremiah this morning who says there's nothing too hard for thee in chapter 32 that we've read from and in verse 17 a little earlier in the chapter. When we come to the New Testament, what does Paul say concerning our God? Well, he says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundant above all that we ask or think as he wrote to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 3 and 20. But you know, this morning as we come, I want to start to look at three phrases this morning that we find in the Word of God that I think will really blow our minds this morning as we stop to consider who it is that's actually in our presence here today. And when we think indeed of the awesomeness of our God. If you want a title for the little message, it's just the God of all. The God of all. Over my next couple of visits, God willing, if you have me back, 
I intend to look at these three phrases and want to spend some time looking at them and seeing what we can learn. You know, there are three writers that God has used to portray himself in three very different and three very amazing ways. I think that this is the only three appearances of this actual phrase within the Word of God. We've read this morning concerning the God of all flesh. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? That's what we're going to do today. In the future, God willing, we'll maybe look at 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 3. What does the Word of God say there? It says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. So not only have we got the God of all flesh, but we've got the God of all comfort. If we move further into our New Testament, we'll find the third. Peter this time, 1 Peter 5 and verse 10, Peter says this, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after ye have suffered a while, make ye perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. The God of all flesh, the God of all comfort, and praise God indeed for the God of all grace. But today we're going to look at the God of all flesh. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard <clears throat> for me? You know, Jeremiah is one of the best known of the prophets, and yet his book has been neglected by so many. He recounts more of his life than any of the other prophets and shows us the reaction of his listeners as well as sharing details concerning his ministry, his testing, and his personal feelings. Just the man that God would find suitable to share this verse with us, a verse tucked away here in the Old Testament in the canon of Scripture. You know, as I considered this verse through the week, it really just brought before me again the greatness of our God, the God of all flesh. Surely as we look in the Old Testament, if we focus in on the Psalms, surely there we read in Psalm 33 and 9, for he spake, it was done, he commanded, and it stood fast. Again in Psalm 19 we read, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. As we open our Bible, surely we can see very early on in the first two chapters, surely we can see the mighty God that we have come to worship here today. Genesis 1 and 2, it recounts for us there concerning the creation of all things. You don't need me to come to Ballyclare to tell you about it this morning, but I just want to remind you today, day one, light, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Day two, we see the firmament. Day three, we see separation of land and of, of water and the creation of plant life. Day four, we see the sun, the moon, and the stars. What does the Word of God say? It says that He made the stars also. Day five, we see the fish and the birds. We see the, the sea life and the sky life. Day six, we see indeed domestic animals and man. What does the Word of God say? It says, so God created man in His image. And you know, we were reminded in the prayer meeting this morning concerning this one day in seven, a day set aside. What is happening on day seven of creation? It says that God rested from His work. You know, dear friends, this morning, as we read the account of creation, what does God say? He says that it was very good. What an amazing God we have today. But you know, not only can we see him as the great creator God in these early chapters, but you know, as we read on throughout the scriptures, we learn so much again concerning him. We see him not, not here as the the creator God, but we can think of him concerning one that is the omnipotent God, the almighty, the supreme, 
the Most High, one with unlimited power. But not only as the omnipotent God, but as the omnipresent God, the one present in all places at all times. But not just the omnipotent God or the omnipresent God, but He's the omniscient God this morning. He's the all-knowing one. Wonder is there one in this morning? Maybe an older friend. We've already addressed the boys and girls this morning. But I wonder is there one in this morning and that you're still not saved? You're still out of Christ and without a Savior. I wonder as we have considered this great God of creation this morning, I wonder would it, would it stop you on your downward track? Would you realize that this one that made the light, this is the one who indeed as the Son could speak of himself, he would say that I am the light of the world. This is the one that came to shine a light upon the darkness and the depravity of man. What did he say in John 3? He said that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds, they're evil. Dear friend, this morning, this is the one. Each of us here this morning can only remember the Lord today. We can only boast today of a name that is written in heaven because of one the light of the world. And what happened? He entered into darkness at the place called Calvary. We'll touch on that as we gather around the table a little later. But you know, dear friends, as we enter another week as the children of God, you know, we can take that confidence with us of having the presence of one with us day by day, one that is at our elbow, and we can have that confidence because what does the end of the verse say? It says, is there anything too hard for me? What a God we have this morning. But you know, it's all very good to come and to portray God in this way. But you know, I want to get down to the crux of the matter this morning. I live in a very real world. I see things in a very real way. And just, dear friends, this morning, just where the rubber hits the road, I want to tell you about the God of all flesh this morning. We all have those problems in life. We all have those concerns, each and every one of us. What are you here with this morning? What is the concern that lies heavy on your heart? Is it the concern... For an unsaved family member, maybe a wayward child. You know, dear friend, this morning, if this God of all flesh was able to save the Apostle Paul, one that was breathing out threatenings and slaughter, one who was torturing the early church, one who would go on to say, that he classed himself as being the chief of sinners. Can I ask you this morning, have you not confidence that our God can save that wayward boy? That our God can save that wayward girl? I'm going to test you now. How well have you been listening to me this morning? Did you listen to the introduction? Did you listen to the phrases that I stumbled across during the week? What did I tell you? I said that there's no person too hard for our God to save. Maybe this morning it's not concern for an unsaved family member. Again, this was mentioned in the prayer meeting this morning. Maybe the concern is <clears throat> for children as they return to university or school, as they continue their education in these strange times, and maybe, you know, as they've been in lockdown, maybe indeed the mental health issues that it could cause. Maybe you're a little bit older this morning and your children are that little bit older and maybe it's not the university and the school, but maybe this morning it's children that are that little bit older. Children that are maybe contemplating marriage. Maybe contemplating a partner in life. Maybe that's what's weighing heavy on your heart this morning. Again, I refer to my introduction. What did we say? He said that there's no prayer too hard for our God to answer. Let's move on. I don't know the situation here in Ballyclare. 
I know that in Cook we have numerous ladies that work for the NHS on the front line. Maybe it's similar for you this morning. Maybe the uncertainty in your heart today is for your partner as they maybe continue to go to work on the front line in these dark and these difficult days. Maybe the concern is, will the PPE do its job? As they come back into the house, will they bring this virus back into the house? It's a concern for us all. And dear friends, this morning, you know me well enough now, don't think that I'm standing up on a pedestal this morning and saying to you, you shouldn't be worrying about anything. I'm just trying to say to you this morning, this is what the Word of, <coughs> the Word of God has to say. But you know, dear friend, with regard, <coughs> pardon me, with regards to your partner going to the front line, I just would tell you this morning, the Word of God, the writer to the Hebrews, we haven't time to argue about who that was this morning, but the writer to the Hebrews lifted his pen and he says that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What did our introduction say? It said that there's no promise too hard for our God to fulfill. You know, maybe the situation's completely different with you this morning. Maybe it's the health of a partner. Maybe it's the health of an older parent that concerns you today. Well, dear friend, can I just say to you this morning, surely the God that created Adam out of the dust of the ground, the same God that without general anesthetic was able to take that rib from Adam to create Eve, the all-knowing one that knew that that rib was the only bone within the body that would grow again, surely this God can be trusted even with these issues this morning. You know, the same one that we've read of in the Old Testament, surely as we focus in on the Savior even today, surely we see that one that was able to come, the one that was able to draw alongside, the one that could make the lame to walk and the blind to see. Don't we read of him, isn't it, in John chapter 9? where he spat in the clay and he anointed the man's eyes. What an amazing God we have this morning. Take heart today, because there's no problem. That's too hard for our God to solve. You know, maybe today, as a church this morning, maybe you're concerned about the town of Ballyclare. You know, the fact that Sunday School and Good News Club has been closed down in a sense. Maybe you wonder to yourself, how is it that we're ever going to get back to normality? How can we ever <clears throat> continue to further the gospel even in our locality when we can't have these face-to-face -face meetings? You know, dear friends, this morning, I believe that things came to a standstill for a reason. Somebody sent me a message on WhatsApp over lockdown. And it went along the lines of this. It went as if God was speaking and it said that you worship sports stars. I will close down the stadium. You worship actors today. I'll close down the theatre. You worship pop singers today. I will close down the arenas. You worship money today. I will collapse the stock market. You know, that was written in a sense with the thought of the unsaved. But yet, dear friends, today, how often throughout the week, and I'm not here to criticize and to, to complain. I'll be honest, I watched Lauren play Linfield on Friday night. But dear friends, this evening, how often do we waste our time on the actors, the sports stars, 
making the money. Dear friends, today, I believe that God has caused a lockdown in a sense to shake us up as the people of God today and to realize that there are more important things at stake. But dear friends, today, a shining light goes out into the town of Ballyclare. Just remember today that there is indeed no place too hard for our God to revive. You know, we could consider today <clears throat> even the words of that well-known verse in Isaiah 41 and 10, where it says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. Did you notice in my introduction this morning that I spoke about the greatness of our God, about the awesomeness of our God? You know, dear friends, as we head out into another week, I want you to look at that verse very closely this morning. Isaiah 41 and 10, seven points. As we go out into another week, it would tell me that on Sunday, fear thou not. Monday, for I am with thee, praise God. Tuesday, be not dismayed. Wednesday, for I am thy God. Thursday, I will strengthen thee. Friday, I will help thee. Saturday, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Praise God today for one that's at our elbow. Not only as we stand in the pulpit, but as we take our leave, one that keeps our hand upon us as we travel on the dangerous roads, one that keeps his hand upon us as we're working day in and day out. This is the mighty God that is our God this morning. You know, when it comes to these matters that we've mentioned, the unsaved family members, the sickness of parents or of partners, those working on the front line, our children. When it comes to these matters, my wife went to a ladies' meeting one night and she came home and she told me about an illustration that the lady had used as she had spoke to them concerning their prayer life. I just briefly want to leave it with you today. You know, all of these things, as I have said, they can be a concern for us. But you know that lady, as she came, she used the brown envelope illustration. And she said to the ladies that were gathered that night, she says, you know, as something comes upon your heart, and as maybe you would be inclined to start to worry. She says, can I encourage you today? She says, just to take that issue and just write it onto a piece of paper. And she says, get yourself a brown envelope. And she says, before you put the piece of paper into the envelope, she says, pray to God about it. She says, slide it into the envelope and put the envelope up into the cupboard. And she says, just leave it with the Lord. I challenge you today. I challenge me today. How often have we prayed about any of these matters? And you know what we're doing? We're running across the kitchen floor. You're getting the chair. You're up and you have the envelope back out and you have the piece of paper back out and you're worrying about it again. Can we not take these matters to the Lord? Put them in the brown envelope and put them away and just leave them in the hands of the Lord. You know, I've come today and I'm going to tell you a story, a personal story about a prayer issue. And without, time's nearly gone, without going into too much detail, my daughter was doing a three-year degree 
and she had three placements to do, one in each year. She did the first one in Liverpool. She did the second one at home and actually in the village of Cook, where we're, where we're from. You know, there was a lot of concern for me as a father and for her mother, and even for her herself, as to using public transport to get to her placement and come home. And you know, we had been praying about it. And again, this is only an illustration, but this is just to show the greatness of our God. Not because of how great I am or how much that, that I have sway with God. But dear friend, this morning, can I tell you that my daughter was supposed to be going to do a placement. Don't start to laugh, because I did when I was told, which was three hours each way in travel. Three hours there, eight hours in the classroom, and three hours back. But you know what? We prayed about it as a family. And can I tell you today that what she was told whenever it first came about was legislation says that two placements out of three have to take place in the country that you're doing your degree. Can I tell you today that that was overturned? Can I give you a heart today and tell you where it was overturned? It was overturned in Parliament. Because our God says that there's nothing too hard for me. You know, as we consider these things from time to time, none of us know what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. So can I plead with you today, just before you stop to worry, ask yourself this question again concerning our God. Is there anything too hard for him? I want to read you a poem that I came across yesterday afternoon as I was preparing or finishing off preparing the message for today. It just says this, How great, how mighty, how sublime, where every nation, every claim, he is the Lord, O oh, tell his worth to him alone. They owe their birth. Say, canst thou make one tiny star to guide the mariner from afar or make a blade of grass to grow his marvelous wisdom? Who can know? The birds, the beasts, the flowers as well. God's power and greatness surely tell for ripened fruit and golden grain he sends the sunshine and the rain. In every vale and leafy glade, God's handiwork is there displayed. Those rocks, those mountains towering high, that rear their summits to the sky, where only eagle pinions rise, beyond the scan of mortal eyes, to speak one message all combined. The hand that made them is divine. But all creation's works alone could ne'er the heart of God make known redemption's plan so great, so vast, as even by angels grasp surpassed. Behold him in a manger lie, the Lord of earth and sea and sky. See him in Gethsemane, in such dreadful agony. While those he loves in slumber sleep, their vigil they could never keep. Hush while on Calvary's cross we gaze. What words are these? The Savior says, Father, forgive them, oh, what grace, to rebel sons of Adam's race, pardon from an offended God, pardon through the Savior's blood, tis finished, now the victor cries, then bows his sacred head and dies, surpassing wisdom, power and might, revealing God in purest light, frail stammering tongues can never tell. Such love immense, unsearchable. But when we see thy face above and know the fullness of thy love with ransomed and unsinning heart, 
will shout, My God, how great thou art. You know, dear friends, this morning as we draw our remarks to a close, I just want to say that I present to you this morning our God, the one that Jeremiah described as the God of all flesh. We trust indeed that God will bless his word to our heart. I'll just close this part of our meeting in a word of prayer. Our Father, we bow in thy presence and we give thee thanks again for this, the Lord's day. We thank thee indeed for the privilege that we've had today to gather with the saints of God in this place and another time, our Father, to open and to read the precious word of God. We praise thee, our Father, for what we see in it concerning thyself, how thou art indeed the great creator God. We praise thee, our Father, that as we've even read the lines to this poem, we're thankful, our Father, that it does indeed take us to Gethsemane and even through Calvary. And our Father, we praise thee indeed for the great redemptive work of our God. We praise thee indeed for a God of love, one who indeed sent the Savior to come, that he might indeed come to the scene of time, that he would go to the cross, and that he would indeed finish that work. Our Father, in cry and triumph that it is finished. So, our Father, we just indeed commend each and every head bowed in thy presence just now to thee today. Our Father, thou knowest, our Father, that as our faces differ, so do our needs. Surely, our Father, we have tried to deal with the day-to-day -day circumstances that many find themselves in. And we trust, our Father, today that we have uh, succeeded, our Father, in encouraging thy people today in realizing indeed again the greatness of our God. So, our Father, we just commend ourselves to thee now. Pray, our Father, for those that must leave us. Pray indeed that thou would take them to their homes in safety, especially those, our Father, that know thee not as their own and personal Savior. And for those of us, our Father, that will remain around the table this morning to remember the Lord in our own appointed way, we trust indeed that we would indeed have that sweet remembrance of him, for we do indeed ask it in the Savior's worthy and precious name. Amen.